Shalom and welcome to another time of Israel's Hope Bible Church Online. My name is Ron Grossman and this message is for December 31st, 2023. It's the last message for the year. It's the first message for the new year because it's a New Year's encouragement message for you. We spent the month of December. We did four messages on Messianic prophecies. We're going to do something today. It's just a little bit different. We're still going to be in the prophets. If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 59. We're going to be taking a look at various points made in verses between verses 9 and 21 in that chapter. Before we start, let's stop. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to direct us. We do ask Father God now that uh, your Holy Spirit would guide and direct in everything said and done. We pray perhaps that one person may come to know you as Savior through what we discussed today. You are the Redeemer, as mentioned here, the Holy One of Israel. And we ask, Lord God, that you would reveal yourself to some who would pay attention to this today. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So follow with me, please. We're going to read verses 9 through 21. I'm going to make a few general comments. Our message won't be as long today as it has been in the past, but let's take a look at what it has to say. Therefore is judgment far from us, neither does judgment overtake us. We wait for light, but behold, obscurity, for brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday, as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar like bears, all like bears, and mourn, soar like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far off from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backwards, and justice stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth fails. And he that departs from evil makes himself a prey, and the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and then was clad with zeal as a cloak. Therefore... According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. <clears throat> and the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them says the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee and my words which I put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of your seed, nor out of the mouth of your seed's seed, says the Lord, from henceforth and forever. We're always contextualists with the word, context of time, place, person, specifics. Who is the writer? Isaiah. Who is he writing to? Israel. In the 800s BC, more than 800 years before Messiah came, yet we see so much a repeat of things here in this portion between chapter uh, verses 9 to 21 of Isaiah 59. Israel had been falling into sin for a number of years at this point. The Assyrians would come and take away the northern kingdom within 100 years of Isaiah's prophecies. Within 150 years, give or take, the Babylonians would take away the southern kingdom as well. God would restore them, and he did. He allowed them to return under Persian rule in 539 BC. But again, Israel, coming back rejoicing that God had kept his promises never to leave them or, nor forsake them, and allowed them to return to their land, again, eventually, over time, fell back into more sin. And when Jesus arrived on the scene, Israel was in that place again a corrupted priesthood that oppressed the people, making deals with the Romans who oppressed the people in general. And Jesus came at the right time in history, according to Daniel's prophecy, came to be born in the right place, as according to Micah's prophecy, and died ignominiously, Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, according to Isaiah's prophecy, but rose from the dead three 
days later, as Jonah spoke of, coming out of the whale after three days. Jesus applied that to himself. And what did, what did they do, the religious leadership of Israel? They mocked him. Will he be coming out of the, uh, the dead like Jonah came out of the whale? The bottom line is that Israel is in a place right now since the October 7th Hamas incursion into Israel, fighting a war, losing world opinion in the propaganda war that's being fought outside the land, in a place where it seems that they can't do anything right even amongst their own people. There is disagreement and discord over how the hostage situation is being managed by the Israeli armed forces and the Israeli government, the war cabinet. There seems to be no general agreement within the Jewish people, the Hebrew peoples who live in Israel and even outside of Israel. What is so appalling to me is to see quote unquote peaceniks and members of the ultra Orthodox Jewish community marching with the pro Palestinian people, even here in this city where we live. I can't think of anything that's more ridiculous and crazy to march with the people who would have absolutely no uh, problem once they got their way of slitting their throats. The problem that we're we dealing with here is that Israel has remained in sin now for eons. The sin this time though is not against just against God in general. It's against the fact that they came against uh, came to receive Messiah at that right point in history and have the majority of them have been rejecting him ever since. This has put Israel into a place of rebellion against God. But there's something in this passage that's important for us to understand. Regardless of how bad Israel may have been in the past, regardless of how Israel continues to operate today as a people, not just as that geopolitical entity across the uh, ocean in the Middle East, but as a people in general, where the majority still consider uh, Jesus to be the Christian God, nothing to do with us. God says that he will, one, recompense, and two, he will recall his people. When you read in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20, you read what's called the warfare prayer. And in that prayer, Paul, the Apostle Paul starts off by talking about how you should take on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of preparation on your feet, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the belt of truth. Why? So you can withstand the fiery darts of the devil on a daily basis. That's a good prayer template for you to use, where you have the responsibility and the authority to say to Satan and to demons, go, you have no place here with me. God resides within me by the Holy Spirit. I serve God, I don't serve you. You have that authority. I remember being reminded of that just a few short years ago when we were going through a difficult situation here that we had to handle. And I remember someone who's mentored me now for a number of years saying to me, you know, you remember, you have that authority to tell Satan to go, to tell the demons to go. You have that authority. So does Israel. If Israel would take her blinders off, if Israel would recognize who her Messiah is, if Israel would come to God in full and total repentance and say, save us, forgive us, he will. What's interesting here is to read this. It talks in verse 16 how God saw that there was no man and wondered where there, were, where there was no intercessor. An intercessor was sent, and that was in the person of Jesus. It was his arm that brought salvation and his righteousness that sustained him, Israel. He put on righteousness as a breastplate. See, the Apostle Paul didn't just make this up because he was under house arrest in, in Rome and he saw a Roman soldier that he was uh, uh, chained to on a daily basis. He had an opportunity to witness to that Roman soldier. He didn't look at him and say, oh, he's wearing a helmet. That's the helmet of salvation. He's wearing a breastplate. He's like any soldier who goes out to battle. He goes out prepared. God himself gave us this picture, this metaphor here in Isaiah 
through the prophet Isaiah. Look at verse 17. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate. Any good soldier in those days would put on his armor. The breastplate protected the torso of the soldier. And he put on a helmet of salvation to protect the head. The head was the most vulnerable part of, a, of any soldier's body. You took off someone's head, there was nothing left. The point being is that God gives you the armor to be able to withstand the enemy. This same armor remains available to the nation, people, Israel, wherever they are today. It remains available to them and they too can call on God. And if they would call on God as a nation and seek him, God will hear them. You know, that promise is fulfilled in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. But it's going to take Israel to have to get to the end of time before they see who the pierced one is. Because in Zechariah 12, verse 10, it says, They looked on him whom they have pierced, and they mourned for him. You have to ask the question, who is that pierced one? When that happens, they will be, in a sense, in a metaphorical way, putting on the righteousness of, a bre of the breastplate, a helmet of salvation. It will be upon the head of Messiah, who is going to come as the ultimate soldier at the end times. One third of the house of Israel is going to recognize the Messiah at that point in history. <clears throat> history. Zechariah 13 verses 9 and 10 tells us that. But two thirds will still reject him. Even though the majority will reject uh, Israel uh, of Israel will reject Messiah, even right at the end when there seems no hope left, God still will keep his promise and come and save the remnant of the house of Israel, that one third. And the one who has that righteousness as a breastplate, a helmet of salvation, putting on the garments of vengeance, I'm back in Isaiah 59, verse 17. He will have a zeal as a cloak, it says. According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay recompense. <clears throat> when you read in the Hebrew Scriptures and the word islands is used, and it also appears in the book of Revelation, it usually is a reference to the other nations, the other Gentile nations outside of the house of Israel, the other Gentile islands. But the Spirit of God will come, and the fear of the name of the Lord will come from the west, and its glory will be like the rising of the sun. And this is a picture of how Messiah is going to return. He's going to come to that mountain to the east of the city. His two feet will touch down on that mountain one day. He will come with the saints or the armies of heaven, as both Zechariah and John wrote in the book of Revelation as well. And that is the raptured church. We're living in an age now where there's been a lot of influence that's come into the Bible-believing church, particularly here in North America, where the reform view has won the day. I was in a discussion recently with um, some folks at a church we are uh, attending at, and the question came up, well, you hold so strongly to a premillennial, pre-tribulational position, and I said, I do. And what do you do with someone who doesn't? I said, I can't do anything with somebody who doesn't, who, and I won't do anything with somebody who doesn't. If they ask me, I can say something, but it's not for me to say or do something with them. It's up to the Lord. I fervently and strongly continue to believe in a literal hermeneutic and interpretation of the word. And I believe Jesus is coming back before the time of trouble as, Jacob describes, as Jeremiah describes it, the time of Jacob's trouble, and he will supernaturally remove his people, the Bible-believing church, who are physically alive at that time. But the dead in Christ will rise first. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18. It's after all of those things happen in 1 Thessalonians 4 that you read in sequential order that everything will start to unfold sometime after that in the day of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to, 13, 1 to 11, excuse me. It will be the one who will come, whose covenant is with Israel, says the Lord. Verse 21 of Isaiah 59. 
My spirit is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of that mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, says the Lord from henceforth and forever. In other words, God will come and rescue his people, whose word has been put in their mouth, who will believe in God's atoning work, in this Redeemer, in this one who is coming at the right time in history, when there seems to be no hope left for for Israel, God will show up. Over the years, I've met Holocaust survivors, some with a very angry attitude about who God is. Some have said to me, where was God in the Holocaust? He wasn't anywhere but where he was all along. He never was absent. He was always available. He remains available, not just to those of the house of Israel, but to any and all today who would call on his name for salvation. A new year is starting, and this is a year that I think we may see some very interesting things happen around us. God will intervene, I'm pretty certain, in what's going on in the Middle East right now. It may get worse, it may not improve, but one thing I do know for certain, and I do not waver in my faith, is that God's Son Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, is returning, perhaps soon, to take his Bible-believing church out of this world, and then, sometime after that, we'll bring in the final judgment days. Time is of the essence, and I think it's short. I wouldn't want to waste another day, another month, another year, just wondering, is this Jesus really the one who was spoken of? because the scriptures say that he is. Have you accepted him as personal savior? As you're closing down 2023, can I challenge you to consider making 2024 not just a new year, but a new start with God? Do you know him as personal savior? If you don't and you have questions, you can email me directly, ron at ihopecanada.org. And if there is something else we can help you with, still email me at that address. We are a faith ministry. We trust God's people to meet our needs. And through the Lord, he moves them to provide what is needed so that we can do the work of Israel's hope. Would you consider a special end of year, beginning of year gift to Israel's hope ministries so that we can continue doing very much like what we are doing here with you at this time. Go to our webpage, www.ihopecanada.org. You'll find various ways you can give to our ministry. You can be give a donation directly online by an e-transfer. If you are in Canada or if you are even outside of Canada with a Canadian bank account, you can make a direct transfer from your bank account to the iHope account. Again, our webpage is www.ihopecanada.org. You'll see the e-transfer icon when you hit the support us icon, bottom right of the page. You'll see the e-transfer. Just click on that. It will give you the instructions about what you're, you are to do. If you'd like to give a donation through uh, PayPal, one of the most secure ways to give online, you can do that. Hit the PayPal icon. It is a live icon. It takes you directly to our PayPal account. You can make a donation right there. Follow the instructions online. You will also find our P.O. Box here in Ottawa where you can send a donation uh, to Box 47031. Look again, www.ihopecanada.org, and there you will also find, um, when you hit the Support Us icon, all of that that I've just described. We do wish you a good Christmas. We're just um, publishing this a couple of days before Christmas, and a very happy New Year. We're publishing this uh, eight days before the New Year. Our next message will appear online early in January. Thank you for looking in today. We do ask uh, that you pray for us, and we will pray for you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for each person who has looked in, not just today, but throughout the year of 2023. Thank you that you have allowed us to use this um, medium to reach out to a very lost world, but a world that you love so much you sent your only begotten Son to die in place of any and all of us. Use the day now that is left here and the days ahead through as we close down the year to make for a good start to 2024. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. 
coming. So until next time, we say Shalom.